Yes, okay. We are turned on. Uh, where would you like it? Here or here? Mm. Whatever. Yeah, okay. You are the masters. I am a low level servant. Okay. We're on. We're on. You're red. Check. Good afternoon. God is good. All the time. Amen. We enjoyed the lunch together with the flavor of Torrington, Wyoming. <laughs> and we are looking forward to having a wonderful dinner party somewhere out there, enjoying the beautiful landscape and spectacular landscape uh, this evening. This afternoon, we would like to study together the New Covenant and the Kingdom of God. The history of Jesus' birth, life, public ministry, death, and resurrection provoked Jewish society, as well as the Roman Empire. In particular, it disturbed the followers of Judaism in the first century. However, the four Gospels testify that Jesus as the Son of God came to this world as the Messiah, as the fulfillment of prophecy in the Old Testament. Moreover, he was the mediator of the New Covenant. Jesus Christ encountered the spiritual battles fighting against the challenges of Satan especially after his water baptism in the Jordan River. During these spiritual battles, he defeated Satan and demons on behalf of the kingdom of God. After Jesus won the spiritual battles on earth, he victoriously entered Jerusalem Strikingly, God ratified the new covenant through his crucifixion and death. In that sense, our thesis is that the new covenant can be properly identified as a covenant of a royal grant, similar to the pre diluvian Noah covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. The grand and wondrous drama of redemptive history inaugurated in Genesis 3.15 anticipates that it will be ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. In fact, the old covenant made with the covenant community of Israel through their mediator Moses would be ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. However, the followers of Judaism do not find the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ enveloped in shadows and types, although they read through the Hebrew Bible. This is because they failed to read the Old Testament from a redemptive historical perspective. God revealed only one way to salvation for sinners throughout the Bible. Sinners can only be saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Hallelujah! Therefore, we should read the Old Testament with a 
Christ-centered perspective. The covenant community of Israel made an oath in the presence of Yahweh to uphold the Mosaic covenant. Nevertheless, as you know, they failed to keep the covenant and disobeyed the Mosaic law. At last, God executed the judgment of curses through the covenant laws against Israel. The disobedience of the covenant community of Israel and God's judgment upon them pointed them to the mediator of the new covenant who would fulfill all the requirements of the Mosaic law, which they had failed to uphold and obey. In that sense, we will suggest that the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, at the hands of the Roman Empire, the pagan empire, occurred because the covenant community of Israel broke the Mosaic covenant of law. The disobedience of Israel culminated in the rejection and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In the end, God executed his covenant lawsuit against the covenant community of Israel and poured out his wrath on them by using pagan Roman Empire, thereby making the end of the theocratic kingdom of Israel in the promised land. The ratification of the new covenant and the divine oath. When God revealed the covenant of grace in Genesis 3, 15, he prophesied that the blood of the covenant would be shed by the mediator of the covenant. This signifies that the only way, if you will, only one way for sinners to be forgiven after the fall is through the blood of the covenant. Therefore, God foreshadowed the blood of the covenant in animal blood, ceremonially shed in the Old Testament. It is noteworthy that all the animal blood which was dedicated on the altar of God throughout redemptive history in the Old Testament was decisively and definitely fulfilled through the blood of the Messiah. It is important to remember that the blood of the new covenant shed by the Messiah was the promised blood of the covenant to the covenant people of Israel in the Old Testament. Before his crucifixion, Jesus Christ administered the Last Supper for his disciples and testified that his blood would be the blood of the covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins for the elect. Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28. Jesus prays, my blood of the covenant indicates that the mediator of the new covenant shed his blood as the means of the ratification of the new covenant. In this manner, the author of Hebrews identifies Christ as the mediator of the new covenant. The blood of the new covenant washes away sins committed under the principle of the Mosaic covenant of law. 
This suggests that the blood of the new covenant is intended not only for the elect under the new covenant, notice right here, but also for the elect under the Mosaic covenant, as well as the elect in the period of the patriarchal age, moving back further, including Adam and Eve. Do you grasp this? The author of the book of Hebrews reflects on Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection, and ascension. With the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in mind, he affirms that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. Jesus entered the most holy place of the heavenly kingdom of God after he was sacrificed on God's altar. Afterwards, God granted him the heavenly kingdom of God, and Jesus entered it through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. Hallelujah. The blood of the new covenant of Christ redeems the people of God and grants the promised eternal inheritance, the heavenly kingdom of God for the elect. Because Christ's perfect and meritorious and infinite obedience through his life and death. Meanwhile, the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross was not only the ceremony of the ratification of the new covenant, notice right here, but also God's oath, if you will, God's sworn oath to the covenant. Do you get it here? In redemptive history, as you already found out in our previous studies together, God made a sworn oath when he made his covenants with Abraham and David. In other words, God made a sworn oath in the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant while he guaranteed his rich promises Abraham and David. However, the people of Israel made the sworn oath to the covenant in the Sinai covenant, not by God. As you know, in Exodus 19 to 24, they shouted all together, we'll obey whatever the Lord says, we'll obey. They shouted all together as the covenant community of Israel. In that sense, the Abrahamic covenant and Davidic covenant were the representative examples of the covenant of royal grant in the Old Testament. The Sinai covenant was a form of the covenant of law while it was the covenant of grace in substance, saving the elect by the principle of the covenant of grace under the Mosaic economy. The new covenant is both the climax of the divine covenants and the covenant of royal grant. The divine oath in the diva in ratification ceremony of the new covenant suggests that in fact the new covenant is the culmination and climax of God's covenants revealed in the Old Testament. The author of Hebrews affirms that God made the sworn oath sacrificing his only begotten son on the cross. Hebrews 7, verses 20 to 28. 
The author of Hebrews explains that Levitical high priests became high priests without an oath under the old covenant. However, Jesus Christ became the eternal high priest with God's sworn oath. David in his royal psalm prophesied that the Messiah would be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And the Messiah's eternal priesthood is effective with God's sworn oath. Psalm 110, 4. Verse 21, but this one was made the high priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Is a redemptive historical interpretation of Psalm 110.4. In light of Jesus Christ's crucifixion and death as the eternal high priest. In this regard, then, the new covenant is the culmination, if you will, or highlight of the covenant of royal grant accompanied with the God's sworn oath. which visibly took place with the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord on the cross. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus' bodily resurrection and the reward of the covenant of royal grant. Jesus' death on the cross was the defining moment in redemptive history. We mean a defining moment in redemptive history. Judas Iscariot hanged himself after he sold Jesus to be crucified. The other disciples ran away out of fear before Jesus faced the crucifixion. Yet Jesus anticipated and prophesied his crucifixion and resurrection throughout his public ministry. One day Jesus went to Jerusalem to observe the feast of the Jewish Passover and he cleared the temple courts when he found the people exchanging money and others selling cattle, sheep, and doves. The Jews changed Jesus, challenged Jesus when they witnessed him clearing the temple, questioning his authority. In, G in response, Jesus showed indirectly that he anticipated his death and resurrection, speaking about his body figuratively as the temple. The Bible says, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. John 2, verses 19 to 22. Neither the Jews nor Jesus' disciples understood that Jesus Christ anticipated his death and bodily resurrection when he said, destroy this temple. And three days I will raise up. 
at that moment. When Jesus visited the district of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked about the people's conception of the identity of the Son of Man. Peter made his famous confession about Jesus when his disciples, when the disciples were asked by Jesus, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah! You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter's confession was a turning point of Jesus' public ministry because from that time, Jesus began to predict his death and bodily resurrection in the presence of his disciples. Peter's famous confession about the Son of Man in the district of Caesarea Philippi marked the end of Jesus' ministry in the area of Galilee. After this, he had it south towards Jerusalem, anticipating his death and bodily resurrection. Jesus predicted his death and resurrection in Jerusalem to his disciples as he prepared for a final journey to Jerusalem with his disciples. Matthew 16, verses 21 to 23. It is very important to note that Matthew's testimony of Jesus' death and resurrection here uses passive verbs. Example, Jesus must be killed and be raised. It signifies that Jesus' bodily resurrection, notice right here, was God's grant to his faithful and obedient son who obeyed unto his death to accomplish his redemptive work through his life and earthly ministry. In that sense, Jesus' crucifixion and death and his bodily resurrection are two wills. Two wheels of the wagon, the famous wagon you can see in famous city, Torrington, Wyoming. <laughs> Two wheels. Two wheels of a beautiful and wondrous wagon. in Torrington, Wyoming. Jesus again, again predicted his death and bodily resurrection to his disciples as they gathered in Galilee. In doing so, Jesus used a future passive tense about his resurrection. The Bible says, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of a man, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. Notice right here. He will be raised on the third day. Passive verb. And they were greatly distressed. Matthew 17, verses 22 and 24. Here, Jesus' prediction about his bodily resurrection, he will be raised on the third day, reveals that his bodily resurrection will be 
God the Father grant as he prepares a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus predicted his suffering, death, and resurrection in Jerusalem to his disciples. The Bible says, and as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Notice right here. And he will be raised on the third day. Hallelujah! He will be raised on the third day. Matthew 20 verses 17 to 19. The four gospel writers commonly testify that the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we pay close attention to the story of Jesus' bodily resurrection three days after his crucifixion and death, we realize that Jesus' resurrection was God the Father's grant to his faithful son, who was obedient unto his death, fighting against Satan and his kingdom. Matthew 28, verses 1 to 10. The announcement of an angel of the Lord to the woman signifies a very important truth about Jesus' bodily resurrection. Matthew 28, verse 6, He is not here, for he has risen. The translation of English Standard Version should be translated as he is not here, for he was raised, because the, the verb agerthe is an aorist passive third person singular, which carries the significant meaning that God the Father raised the Son from the grave after three days, as it was anticipated and prophesied. Furthermore, Matthew 28, verse 7, Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. The translation of English Standard Version should be also translated as then go quickly and tell his disciples that he was raised from the dead. Because he was raised from the dead. Carries the meaning of God's intention that Jesus' bodily resurrection was God the Father's grant to his Faithful Son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Can we shout amen all together? Amen. amen. So that Satan trembles. Liberal Christians tremble. Liberal theologians who deny the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, they may tremble. You know the famous New Testament scholar, German New Testament scholar, the most highly decorated missionary in the 20th century, winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 1953. That recognized 
by the people, propagating the philosophy of reverence for life. Right? The most decorated missionaries in 20th century, right? Albert Schweitzer, what do you think? He received his PhD degree studying New Testament especially for gospel. He published his book, famous book, about the quest of the history called Jesus. But then he didn't believe in Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death and bodily resurrection from the grave. At the same time, became the most decorated and most famous missionary in 20th century. That's what's happening even now. So if you believe in Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death, and after three days in bodily resurrection from the grave and shout Amen, Amen. you have to shout that. To the city of uh, Torrington, beautiful city. To the state of Wyoming, to the liberal Christians, liberal pastors, liberal missionaries, liberal theologians who don't believe Jesus Christ's sacrificial death and bodily resurrection. What are you going to preach, Pastor Nate Johnson, as a pastor, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, his sacrificial death, death and bodily resurrection, which are two twins of a beautiful bandwagon in Torrington, Wyoming? What are you going to preach if you lose that? Maybe love, 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 and love. We welcome everyone. We love everyone. No judgment, no hell, no heaven. So the stories of the life of Jesus Christ in the four Gospels culminate in the glorious bodily resurrection of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the glorious visible and the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, notice right here, is his official coronation ceremony. As the king and lord of the eschatological kingdom of God, which is granted by God the Father. Hallelujah. Although Jesus directly predicted his death and resurrection, Three times before his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, his disciples did not understand that Jesus' resurrection was in fact God's grant to his faithful servant son who obeyed unto his death as the mediator of the new covenant. However, after they witnessed Jesus' death, Jesus' sacrificial death, bodily resurrection, bodily ascension, and the Pentecost event, they fully realized that Jesus' bodily resurrection, the glorious bodily resurrection, was indeed God's, the Father's grant 
through his son, Jesus Christ. When you think about the nation of Israel, what do you think of? When you think about ethnic Israelite or Jews, what do you think of? We hope after our studies you have very clean clue about the nation of Israel and also ethnic Israel, defined, explained by the Bible. Israel's disobedience and the fall of Jerusalem. Yahweh confirmed the inauguration of the Davidic kingdom through the Davidic covenant. 2 Samuel 7 verses 1 to 14. Although the establishment of the Davidic kingdom was God's grant to the people of Israel in the promised land, the continuation of the Davidic kingdom was dependent upon the Israelites' obedience to the Mosaic law. As we know, Jesus came as the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy of the Old Testament, which began in the proclamation of the primitive gospel in Genesis 3, 15. However, the majority of Israelites rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah and the Son of God. The Israelites' rejection and unbelief was the culmination of their disobedience to the Mosaic law. Because the heart of the Mosaic law in fact, typified and foreshadowed the coming Messiah. This is also the historical background explaining why Jesus Christ pronounced the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which was the symbolic place of the presence of God. In the beginning of the Olivet, Discourse, the famous Olivet Discourse on the Mount of Olives, Jesus prophesied the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The Bible says Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. Along with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, Jesus prophesied the fall of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem was the heart of the promised land. Moreover, it was the heart of the David kingdom, which was the theocratic kingdom typified in the everlasting kingdom of God on earth. After Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem before his crucifixion, he prophesied the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem. Luke 21, verses 22-24. Jesus' prophecy of the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem was exactly fulfilled in AD 70, as you know. God used the pagan empire, Roman empire, to prosecute his covenant lawsuit 
against the disobedient Israelites who constantly violated the Mosaic covenant of law. Finally, the Roman soldiers, under the leadership of Titus, son of the emperor Vespasian, attacked and destroyed the city of Jerusalem as well as the temple from 66 to 70 AD. In that sense, we can say that the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple was a redemptive historical event because it was the historical mark of the termination of the old covenant order. Furthermore, it was the historical mark of the termination of the theocratic kingdom of Israel in the promised land as God's covenant lawsuit against the people of Israel who constantly broke the old covenant, inaugurated in Exodus 19 to 24. <clears throat> the, major the majority of ethnic Israel rejected Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God, ultimately crucifying him. They also rejected the good news of the gospel, persecuting the apostles and Christians. Nevertheless, the apostle Paul in Romans gave a prophetic message that all Israel will be saved. What does that mean? All Israel will be saved. Apostle Paul's prophetic message provides us with a comprehensive picture of ethnic Israel. Paul said, lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, notice here, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion who will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Romans 11 verses 25 to 27. What do you think of when you hear when Apostle Paul says all Israel will be saved? In Romans 11 verse 27. Apostle Paul discusses how God is faithful to save ethnic Israel even as he is faithful to save the elect among the Gentiles. In Romans 9, 1, 11, 36. This truth provides the background for Paul to say, and in this way all Israel will be saved. This suggests that the remnant and, in, and the elect among the ethnic Israel will be saved by God's grace in Christ Jesus, even though the theocratic kingdom of Israel was terminated by God's covenant lawsuit against Israel due to their disobedience to the Mosaic law and the rejection of Jesus Christ in AD 70. Herman Bobbink rightly interprets Romans 9 to 11 in light of God's redemptive history, suggesting that a remnant chosen by God in Israel has always been saved. Likewise, all Israel in Romans 11:26 26 
It's not the national conversion of the people of Israel at the end of time as Kiliasts or dispensationalists falsely insist. Rather, all Israel is the elect from Israel who will be saved throughout time until the second coming of Jesus Christ. When we view the ancient history of Israel in light of redemptive history, <clears throat> God chose Israel as a chosen nation and people under the Old Covenant. <clears throat> Nevertheless, <clears throat> excuse me, because I am captivated by the landscape of Torrington, Wyoming. <laughs> I am lost because the beautiful, spectacular landscape, the endless horizon, beautiful landscape that we cannot see and observe in Maryland, where I live. <clears throat> Thank you. The water saves. <clears throat> Two different horizons. The water saves the covenant community. Through God's wonders of baptism, on the other hand, the water judges the uncovenant community at the time of Noah. <clears throat> when we view the ancient history of Israel in light of redemptive history, God chose Israel as a chosen nation and people under the old covenant. Nevertheless, it suggests that not all the people of Israel were saved, but only a remnant chosen by grace. So Paul in his statement that all Israel will be saved provides a glimpse into Israel. In doing so, he suggested that a remnant chosen by grace or all the elect among the Jews who will be saved under the new covenant until the second coming of Christ. We hope now you settled about the issue of Israel and the meaning of all Israel will be saved in Romans 11, 26. The conquest of Canaan under the Old Covenant and global mission under the New Covenant. When you read through the book of Joshua, the conquest story, what do you think of? Wiping out and killing everyone without no exception, including innocent babies. What do you think of it? Liberal Christians, liberal scholars, because they don't understand it, they say, well, it's just a made story or exaggerated hyperbolic story written by unknown historian. Sometime, sometime during the Babylonian exiles. What do you think of yourself as a Bible, Bible believing Christians in the beautiful, beautiful city of Torrington, Wyoming? What do you think of it? Is it really happened? Or just exaggerated, hyper, hyperbolic story, made out story as a famous Old Testament scholar, John Walton, Old Testament professor, 
in Whitton College. You're going to follow John Walton? Or the outlandish J.K. John? Or your faithful pastor, Dave Johnson? If you believe that the conquest history written in the book of Joshua really happened, then say, Amen. Amen. You are the remnant in the city. We can tell. Yahweh commanded the covenant community of Israel to fight holy war when they conquered the promised land. To accomplish that mission, he ordered total destruction, harem, in the process of conquering the promised land. On the other hand, Jesus Christ commanded his disciples to love even their enemies, enduring persecution even unto death. How can you harmonize two apparent contradiction stories? How could you harmonize to properly understand this apparent contradictory command? It is necessary to examine these episodes from redemptive historical and eschatological perspectives. The Old Covenant and the Conquest of Canaan. God promised through the Abrahamic Covenant that the theocratic kingdom would be established in the Promised Land. Yahweh made the covenant on Mount Sinai with the promised descendants of Abraham through Moses, the mediator of the covenant. Exodus 19 to 24. Surprisingly, within the historical context, context of the Mosaic Covenant, Yahweh the Lord issued a very cruel command to the covenant community of Israel that would cross the Jordan River and enter the land of Canaan. Yahweh's command was to destroy the seven tribes of Canaan that had lived peacefully in the land ever since their ancestors had permanently settled there. How could God, loving God, gracious God, merciful God, give such a brutal command to the covenant people as the God of love? When Yahweh made the Mosaic Covenant with the covenant community of Israel, the conquest of Canaan was surely promised and commanded. And Yahweh promised that the enemies of Israel would be blotted out, totally destroyed from the land of Canaan, little by little, until Israel possessed the promised land. Exodus 23, verses 22, 20, 33, 34, verses 10 to 16. Yahweh renewed the Mosaic Covenant with Israel when they reached the plain of Moab after 40 years in the wilderness. In the process of the covenantal renewal, he reminded them again to fight the Holy War, Haram, when they conquered the promised land. It is important to note that the word total destruction, harem, was used for the first time in the historical context of the Mosaic Covenant renewal. The Bible says, and the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Gergashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations 
more numerous and mightier than yourself. And when the Lord your God gives them over to you, and you defeat them, then notice right here what God says. You must devote them to complete destruction. Haram. Complete destruction. Listen here. Notice here. To complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. Deuteronomy 7 verses 1, 2, 3. How could you understand this? Merciful God, gracious God, loving God, how can gracious God command march into the, the land of Canaan and say you have to destroy it totally, Haram. Crying babies, innocent babies, beautiful ladies, no exception, no exception. You have to destroy them. That's why in the early church, Marcion, he read it through the Old Testament and just didn't make sense to him and saying, okay, the God of Old Testament God is not loving God, so I have to reject the Old Testament as a whole, as a, the part of a Bible. Right? In my area, if we go to uh, nearby there, um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there is Amish community, right? Amish community. And they, they believe that the history of a conquest really is not part of the Bible. It's not part of the Word of God because it doesn't make sense to them. The true word of God in the Bible is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, because Jesus says, love your enemies. Right? But we need to eschatologically interpret and understand Yahweh's command of total destruction by the covenant community of Israel in the process of the conquest of Canaan. Remarkably, Yahweh demonstrated the vivid picture of the day of a final judgment through the conquest of Canaan typologically and symbolically. In fact, God will execute his final judgment by the means of a total destruction, harem, when the parousia comes. Hallelujah! No one can escape the final judgment. Only the elect alone in Jesus Christ will enter the fully realized kingdom of heaven and have a full access to the new heaven and the new earth. In that sense, the final judgment will be glorious and a victorious one for the elect. However, it will be the day of a fiery judgment for the reprobate who are not in Jesus Christ, last Adam, because they will be thrown into everlasting hell. The glorified elect with the bodily resurrection will fully realize the everlasting kingdom of God under the reign of the exalted heavenly king. Our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. The new covenant and global mission. If you listen to the title of the new covenant and global mission, what do you think of? 
As a Bible believing community in beautiful city of Torrington, Wyoming, you need to open your eyes to the global mission field. Shout Amen. amen. <laughs> Between his resurrection and his ascension to heaven, Jesus Christ gave the great commission to his beloved disciples. This was an eschatological commission to the disciples, directing them to go out and spread the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God from the promised land to all nations, embracing Jews and Gentiles together without any prejudice. The Bible says, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to absorb all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am always with you to the end of the age. Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Jesus Christ decisively proclaimed the victory of the kingdom of God against the power of the kingdom of Satan through his life, death, and resurrection. After his death and bodily resurrection, he affirmed to his disciples that all authority in heaven and on earth has given to me. Before his enthronement in the glorious heavenly kingdom of God, after his ascension, Jesus ordered the Great Commission, the mission to all nations, embracing both Jews and Gentiles, going and making disciples of all nations was the central focus of the Great Commission. In pronouncing these marching orders, Jesus sealed them with the Trinitarian formula, saying, In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and, on, and of the Holy Spirit. In addition, Jesus' great commission envisioned the mission to all nations, the global mission, if you will, under the guidance and the outworking of the triune God. This is the reason why he gave the command in the name of the Trinitarian God. In that sense, Jesus' commission to his disciples was not only the eschatological vision of a mission to all nations under the new covenant, but was also self-identification of his deity as one with the triune God. When Jesus gave an order to his disciples to go out from the promised land, he indirectly indicated that, indicated that the theocratic kingdom in the promised land was coming to an end. It is a redemptive historical reversal when the covenant community of Israel entered and conquered the promised land, the theocratic kingdom of Israel was visibly shaped and realized. It was the earthly vision of the Abrahamic covenant. However, the theocratic kingdom of Israel was only a shadow or type of the kingdom of heaven in Jesus Christ. So Jesus great commission to his disciples to go out from the promised land, spreading the gospel to all nations, meant that the theocratic kingdom of Israel 
was eventually coming to an end. History proved that this redemptive historical reversal, the theocratic kingdom of Israel, ended in AD 70 when Jerusalem fell under the attack of the Roman Empire. At the same time, this signaled that the period between the first and second coming of Jesus Christ would be identified as the last days in which the gospel should be proclaimed and spread to all nations. Not only the beautiful city of Torrington, Wyoming in the United States of America, but to South Korea, North Korea, Bolivia, China, South Africa, Brazil. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The gospel should be proclaimed and spread to all nations beyond the promised land, expanding the spiritual kingdom of God globally. Yahweh ordered <clears throat> the waging of holy war, employing total destruction, annihilation, annihilating idol-worshipping pagan Gentiles in Canaan. When the covenant community of Israel under the old covenant marched in to conquer the, and conquered the promised land. At the time, the law of retaliation, Lex Italianis, was the governing principle of the covenant community of Israel in the maintenance of justice and prevention of social evil under the old covenant. Deuteronomy 19, verses 15 to 21. However, Jesus Christ did not order total destruction when he commanded his disciples under the new covenant to go out from the promised land and spread the gospel to all nations. Rather, he ordered them not to fight and retaliate even against the persecutors and enemies, but to embrace pray, forgive, and love them unto death, fighting not a military war, but a spiritual war. Strikingly, this teaching was given to his disciples, not after his bodily resurrection, when he gave the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20 but in the early stage of his earthly ministry. After Jesus chose his original 12 disciples. As we read from the famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, <clears throat> an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Can you do that? If you can do, shout amen. And if anyone would Sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would, who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, notice right here what Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father, who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and 
on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Matthew 5, verses 38 to 46. Likewise, the covenant community under the new covenant should love God and their neighbors and expand their horizon of love, praying and loving their persecutors and enemies even unto death. From the perspective of the kingdom of God, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, notice right here, is the proclamation of the coming of the eschatological kingdom of God. Remarkably, it arrived and was inaugurated after Jesus' incarnation, life, death, bodily resurrection, ascension, and enthronement at the right hand of God in heaven. The vision of the coming eschatological kingdom of God was proclaimed and taught by Jesus to his disciples and others, although even his disciples did not comprehend its meaning at that moment. In short, Jesus' teaching provided an eschatological kingdom lifestyle under the new covenant now. It is God's will to spread the gospel to the global community, saving the elect along with expanding his eschatological and spiritual kingdom of God to all nations through believers' evangelism and mission. By God's grace, we live in the eschatological age under the blessings of the new covenant in fact, New Covenant is the culmination of the Divine Covenants, which began in the covenant of creation since the creation of the heavens and earth in the very beginning. It is noteworthy that believers in the global mission age in the 21st century scattered and dispersed in the global community, enjoy the blessings of God's covenantal promises made in the Abrahamic covenant. In fact, the believers under the new covenant are covenant pilgrims in the present world. God in his providence scattered his people after he inaugurated the new covenant. Through Jesus Christ's death and bodily resurrection, in particular the Pentecost event became a redemptive historical turning point for spreading the good news of the gospel to all nations, all tongues, all tribes, beyond the promised land. The constant formation of covenant pilgrims after the Pentecost event under the new covenant is the powerful work and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a leading, invisible, and powerful figure for the Great Commission while he calls and mobilizes the people of God like you, the congregation of Christ the Reformed Presbyterian Church in the beautiful city of Torrington, Wyoming. Hallelujah! The mission to all nations and tribes, tribes is initiated and fulfilled, not by believers, but by the Holy Spirit, who has constantly applied the redemptive work accomplished 
by our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. The visible church under the new covenant is a covenant diaspora community. God in his providence has gathered and dispersed his people using diverse means such as persecution, incredible hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, immigration, famine, war, disastrous war, the development of technology and science. Believers under the new covenant must be aware that the earthly church is a covenant diaspora community formed and developed by the work of the Holy Spirit. In the epilogue of Revelation, Jesus Christ promised, Surely I am coming soon. In fact, he will be coming soon to lead his elect to the everlasting kingdom of God after the final redemptive judgment. The Bible says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers of the, and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent to my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Hallelujah. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I want everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone asks to them, God will add to him the plague described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things say, Surely I am coming soon. Maranatha. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Revelation 22, verses 12 to 21. When the day of the Lord comes and reveals the glorified believers, the beautifully glorified believers with the bodily resurrection will, will be surprised by joy, beauty, gladness, happiness, and holiness due to the realization and fullness of the kingdom of God granted by God the Father in his Son. Undoubtedly, the glorified eschatological kingdom of God will be fully realized in the new heaven and new earth. Thereby, the beauty and glory of the glorified believers' communion with the triune God, God the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Ghost, along with angelic host, will be consummated as the beauty and glory of the triune God will be fully manifested. To be sure at the time, at the same time, the kingdom of Satan, through God's final redemptive judgment, will be perfected through with eternal torment and punishment, completely separated from the beauty and glory of the eschatological kingdom of God. Let's give our honor to our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ and the Triune God. Let's give him big hands. Let us give a big hands to our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you so much for listening and paying attention to the beautiful Korean accent, which is heavenly and glorious. Now we will have the Q&A.